week two of Evensong, our new women's ministry learning group at Christ Presbyterian Church. My name is Melanie Rayner, and I loved hearing from so many of you this week, and I'm really excited about how Evensong is shaping up and the community that I believe God is going to bring us. Know that wherever and however you are listening across our city, your sisters and brothers from Christ Pres are joining us in this moment of refreshment before the week begins. I heard the question this week, what is Evensong? And so I wanted to take a moment to share a little bit about it tonight before we dig into our passage, which we're gonna be studying the story of Naomi from the book of Ruth tonight. And it is this beautiful and unexpected story in scripture and I can't wait to dig into it with you. Uh, but an Evensong is a traditional Sunday evening service centered around liturgy and Psalms and the church calendar. So when I was thinking about what I needed in my own life and what so many of my friends have shared that they would love is a frame. I want a few minutes on Sunday night or Monday evening to frame my week, to remind me of God's nearness, to set my perspective on him before the busyness of another week begins. When my husband and I lived in St. Louis for grad school, our church had a small Sunday evening service. I don't remember what it was called, but we loved it and we went every week. I loved how everyone just came as they were, in workout clothes, in wheelchairs, with their whole families by themselves, from football games or from serving in church all day. We would sit in the quiet, dark sanctuary and go through the liturgy and take the Lord's Supper and sing together. And when we would leave, I would just feel lighter. I felt ordered, like I had done the thing that would give me strength for the whole week and that I just had to make it through seven more days before I could come back and reset. That's my prayer for Evensong, that together we're being poured into before we pour our lives out for others all week. Just come as you are, hear the word, feel the sweet presence of our Lord. We'll follow the ebb and flow of the church calendar in this class as a way of not only ordering our weeks, but our year, drawing inspiration from the church calendar, the seasons of the church, Lent, Eastertide, Pentecost, Ordinary Time, Advent, and so on and on. I'm so thrilled to be starting this journey in Lent, a season that orders our weeks before the glorious restoration of Easter. Isn't that a bit how life feels right now? Easter, spring, the waning of the pandemic are all on the horizon, but we're still sitting in the darkness, aching for the light that we can see, but we can't reach. Last week, we talked about Hagar and her story of suffering and how God not only saw her in her suffering, but he appeared so that she could see him. This week, we're going to look at Naomi's story from the book of Ruth. And to prepare our hearts to enter into Naomi's story, I want to read excerpts from a poem by the poet Mary Oliver. It's called Heavy. That time I thought I could not go any closer to grief without dying. I went closer and I did not die. Surely God had his hand in this as well as friends. Still I was bent and my laughter, as the poet said, was nowhere to be found. Then my friend Daniel, brave even among lions. It is not the weight you carry, but how you carry it. Books, bricks, grief. It's all in the way you embrace it, balance it, carry it when you cannot and would not put it down. So I went practicing. Have you noticed? Have you heard the laughter that comes now and again out of my startled mouth? How I linger to admire, admire, admire the things of this world that are kind and maybe also troubled. Roses in the wind, the sea geese on the steep waves, a love to which there is no reply. Naomi's story is a story of grief, a grief that's a burden that she has to carry, a heavy one. It unfolds at the beginning of the book of Ruth, which is an aside tucked in the historical books. Ruth's story is a critical component of Jesus's genealogy because the young widow Ruth marries Boaz and King David and then Jesus come from their family line. Today, though, I want to dwell in Naomi's story. 
hers is tragedy mixed with hope, a blend that only faith in a living God can stir so beautifully. Let's read Naomi's story together from Ruth 1, 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his son were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years and both Malon and Chilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to our people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. There is a lot going on culturally here that is super important for us to understand. Naomi and her husband were Israelites living in Moab, where their son married Moabite women and not Israelites, which was actually against God's law. Just as a side note here, Ruth was a Moabite. She married into an Israelite family when Israelites marrying foreign women was against God's law. And then God chose her to run Jesus's line through. The book of Ruth is a story of restoration, but it is also the story of a foreign Moabite woman beginning to follow the God of Israel and him choosing her to play a central role in his plan of salvation for the whole world. I love it. I love it so much. This is one of those passages in scripture that just makes me so excited because every time I read it, I learn something new. And thinking about Ruth, not as an Israelite who knew what she was getting into, but as a Moabite who came to know the Lord through the faithfulness of her mother-in-law and then became the grandmother, great-grandmother of King David all the way to Jesus. It's just it's one of those stories that the Lord has written in such a profoundly beautiful way. And I'm so excited um, to be reading it with you. But anyway, when, when Elimelech and their sons died, Naomi had planned to return to Judah, but told her daughters-in-law not to go with her. Why would Israelite men want to marry Moabites? Naomi knew their prospects were limited and she was past childbearing age and could not provide another husband for him. Levitical laws, which Naomi would have followed, required a brother of the deceased to marry the widow. And as Naomi had no more sons and no ability to provide another son, she encouraged Ruth and Orpah to find new husbands from Moab. Naomi wishes two things for Ruth and Orpah, kindness and rest, both delivered to them by God. 
Let's reread verses 8 and 9, and then we'll dig into the meat of what we'll be talking about tonight. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your, her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. We're going to look specifically at three words, Lord, kindly, and rest. First, when we look in the Hebrew, Naomi uses Yahweh when she says Lord. The one true God, Yahweh is the proper name for God, the God of Israel. Naomi is calling on her God to bless her pagan daughters-in-law. She doesn't use Elohim here in the Hebrew, which is a more generic word for a God that might have been more palatable for Ruth and Orpah, her Moabite daughters-in-law. Naomi calls on the God she loves, the one God who is true the God that her daughter-in-law Ruth would begin to claim as her own, setting into motion this piece of God's plan of salvation. Second, Naomi prays that the Lord would deal kindly with Ruth and Orpah. Let's look at the Hebrew word that she uses here, hased, which means steadfast, loving kindness. It's a word choice that matters here, because it is a covenantal word, a word that is often used to describe the unfailing faithfulness of God. It's a word used to describe God's kindness and faithfulness to Abraham, to Joseph, to David, and to us. But the shocking thing about this simple word is not its linguistic meaning. It's that Naomi uses it to describe God after she has lost so much. God is kind? Her husband is dead. Her two sons are dead. She has no prospects of returning to prosperity, to standing in society, to a happy life. The only thing that lays before her is returning empty-handed to her homeland, where she will be dependent on charity for the rest of her days. But God is kind, and he shows kindness, is what she says, and it is what she believes. We see in Naomi a tension between her bitterness and her faith. How can those two feelings coexist? How can she have held such intense sorrow and yet still bless the name of the Lord, still call him kind? She says, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. But what she wishes for her daughter-in-law, what she believes, is that even this hand of the Lord that has gone out against her, against Naomi, can go out kindly toward Ruth and Orpah. Naomi's tension is one that we all experience. It is, it, in fact, it's one of the hardest parts of our faith to reconcile, I think. I know God is good when everything around me feels so bad, and so heavy, and so hopeless. More than that, Naomi is showing concern and compassion for her daughters-in-law, sacrificing her own comfort by telling them to leave. She would live out her days alone, but pray for good things to come to them. The last word that we'll look at today is rest. The Hebrew word here is manuka. Throughout scripture, manuka is used to describe resting places, such as a home or a temple or a campsite. But it also means rest for the soul. It is translated as rest, comfort, quiet. It's the word that appears in Psalm 23, when David writes, he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Naomi wishes a husband to provide a physical dwelling, descendants, and security for her daughters-in-law. But she also wishes them the rest that comes from God. The deep indwelling peace that surpasses our understanding and our circumstances. This little two-verse blessing that Naomi offers Ruth and Orpah teaches us so much about Naomi's heart during her season of suffering. She is not steady in it. She goes on to describe her situation as bitter, saying, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And yet she calls the Lord kind. She calls him rest. She calls him Yahweh, the one true God. So we, as women and men of faith, can also call him our one true God, who lavishes kindness and rest upon us. 
even when our lot is bitter, even when we are empty. In Ruth 4, we read that Ruth marries Boaz and Naomi's fortune is restored. She has a grandson. The women of her town tell her, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. I love that Naomi's story ends beautifully and redemptively. I'm grateful for stories like hers that show us how God takes tragedy and rebuilds from ashes. But you and I know that doesn't always happen to us or to people in scripture. But Naomi's story ends that way, and ours does too. It may not look like a life restored and nourished here in this life, but because of the Redeemer who would come from the line of Boaz and Ruth, we are guaranteed at an eternity. The baby that restored hope to Naomi was but a foreshadow of the baby Jesus, who had come to give us all hope eternal. Let's close tonight with a psalm, which we will do every week, to send us out with the knowledge and confidence of what we have learned. Tonight, I'll read from Psalm 23. Dwell on the word still when you hear it. Manuka, the quiet rest of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.